Yu-Gi-Oh! had a wonderful five-year lifespan on the Game Boy Advance. But one thing these games aren't particularly known for is their use of easter eggs throughout the series. That's because they're pretty hard to come by in these games and are seldom seen online. And while I mostly talk about all the wonderful glitches that are a result of the development team coming up short, I think it's finally time to go over every single easter egg I've found and show off all the places where the developers went above and beyond. Now I've talked about Ultimate Masters a lot on this channel. However, there are two very hidden easter eggs that I've never mentioned and that only come out under the rarest circumstances. The developers managed to hide these within the DP reward system, and most people know that activating certain cards will give you some special bonuses after the duel ends. These cards typically fit the bill of alternate win conditions, so you'll get a juicy bonus for things like assembling Exodia, completing the destiny board, stalling for the final countdown, and winning through the effect of last turn. This rewards the player for going above and beyond during a duel and is a pretty neat addition to the game's economy. But there are two cards who got the reward treatment that really stand out among the rest. The first one is fairly well known and it's the legendary bird Yada Garasu. If you manage to attack your opponent directly with this card under special conditions, you'll get a special result and even a reward for your effort. Now normally when Yada attacks your opponent directly, its effect will activate and if they don't have an answer for this then it's a hard lock and you can continue to beat them down freely. However to get the reward to appear, you need to have the opponent with a fully cleared board and no cards in hand. Only when these conditions are met are you able to attack directly with Yada and the computer will actually surrender during their very next draw step. And I'm not sure I've seen any computer surrender in any Yu-Gi-Oh game ever, so this is definitely a neat trick that the devs added just for a little bit of flavor. However, this one is mostly for show, as you can see, because the reward isn't very big and pulling this off is more of a nod to the player for such a crushing victory. But yeah, so far all these five cards make a whole lot of sense in my opinion. They all have to do with winning, and they all sort of fit that bill of epic win conditions. That is until we get to the last one, which really stands out among the rest. You see, someone on the dev team decided that out of all the cards in the game, the last card to get a special bonus would be Skull Servant. And you can only get this one to appear if Skull Servant himself gets the very last hit that reduces your opponent's life points to zero. And with such a small attack and no effect, you definitely need to go for some sort of setup. Honestly, the range of decks that would even use this card are just extremely slim. It would have to be either a King of the Skull Servants deck or some sort of level one normal monster aggro deck. So I've gotta say, without knowing it already exists, I'm not sure if anyone has ever gotten this to naturally occur ever. So this one was super hidden in the game and something I only found out about during my huge revolution sleuthing. And this reward was definitely really cool to discover but what if I told you that there's a deeper, way harder easter egg reward to get than the skull servant one? Because even though it's kind of ridiculous, it could actually happen during a normal playthrough. However, this next one requires a very specific deck with a very dedicated effort. This is the Konami bonus. You see, deep in the lore of Konami, they love to reference the number 573 as an Easter egg. This number is so important to the franchise as it's where they really made their name. From the System 573 arcade boards, which powered a ton of their early Hallmark arcade cabinets, specifically for the Beat Mania and Dance Dance Revolution series. And while it doesn't seem very deep on the surface to us, in Japanese culture, numbers can also be used in relation to letters and symbols in order to engage in a form of wordplay. Oh, 
This number 573 essentially creates syllables that are pronounced as the word ko, na, and mi. And this isn't only a reference to the name of their company, it's also a reference to the three founding members of it. Kagemasa Kozuki, Yoshinobu Nakama, and Tatsuo Miyasako, whose names were combined to create the word Konami back when the company was founded in 1969. This number takes form in many ways throughout the Konami games of new and old. In Ultimate Masters, they decided to hide this one in a dual reward bonus that will only appear if you end the duel with exactly 5,730 life points. This is actually way harder than it seems because due to the 30 ending, we're going to have to offset the amount in very unconventional ways, and this will ultimately require us to use some very specific monsters. In this game, there are only four that even give us the potential to get this reward. These monsters are Castle of Dark Illusions, King of Yami Makai, Barox, aka Barry, and lastly, Reaper of the Cards. These cards are specifically known for their wonky stats that have the suffix of 30 or 80 instead of the normal 50 ending like all the other monsters. These are also notorious because they all appear in one single duelist deck in the anime, and for this reason, we simply refer to them as the panic cards. Now the Konami challenge really only has two options. You could give the copycat opponent some of the panic monsters and take some very deliberate hits to the face. However, the fastest way to set it up is a simple three card combo of Cyberstein, Mystic Walk, and Poison of the Old Man. This three card combo sets your life points up perfectly from 8,000 to 5,730. Although the thing that makes this really difficult is that you need to make a solid enough deck in order to win the game and not take any more damage, or take any damage before you pull off the combo. This was actually really hard to pull off with one of the ban lists, so I decided to remove it and go with the classic Makiura combo deck in order to complete this on the first turn. But this game wasn't the end of the Konami bonus. In fact, the Konami bonus even made an appearance recently in the mobile game Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, which can be obtained much easier with a three card combo, seeing that your life points are already at 4,000. This reward has quite the legacy and is definitely something you should try to get if you've never done it before. Now let's take a look at another game with some great easter eggs of its own, and that's Yu-Gi-Oh! 7 Trials to Glory World Championship 2005. This free roam game was done in a similar style as Sacred Cards and Reshefa Destruction, but was able to integrate actual Yu-Gi-Oh! mechanics instead of the obscure battle system that appeared in the first two. And you can tell they really tried to make this game special. I like to use the credits as an example, where all the character sprites from the main part of the game are scrolling in front of this card flipping effect in the background, and these cards are actually a one-for-one -one copy of your deck that you use to beat the game. And I mean, it is a little laggy, but I assure you, making this animation was no walk in the park. And at the end of these credits, we get presented a progress ticker that tallies up our wins and card collected percent. And if you're able to get 100% of the cards before getting this trophy, then you get presented a special fireworks show with some cool colors and sound effects that play in the background. There's even a second version of these credits that play after you fully complete the game and show the end game enemies seen in the post game area instead of the main game enemies. And then it shows a special full screen sprite with all the trophies you obtain in order to fully complete the game. Considering most of the Yu-Gi-Oh games don't even have a real credits menu that play at the end of the game, this is a really nice touch, and while these are fairly known on the surface, there are a few hidden easter eggs in this game as well. Now my favorite one has to do with the trophies, and I haven't seen anything about this online yet, so hopefully this will be news to some of you. You see, every time you win a tournament, 
you get presented a trophy on a special screen with falling confetti to celebrate your victory. Most people only see the screen for a few seconds before pressing A or B in order to collect their money and go home. However, there's a special animation that plays for every single trophy only if you idle on the screen for an entire minute. And this may not seem that hidden, but trust me, this feels like forever whenever you sit there and wait for it, and this is only something people would find by accident. One eternity later. After finding the first one, I was determined to go back to the game and see every single one. And so this is what I came up with. So yeah, I really enjoyed these, and if you ever need to take a break after beating a tournament, then this screen is the perfect place to do it. Now I'd say the most well-known easter egg in this game is the Konami code. This code is actually present in a very large amount of games, and it's typically related to cheat codes or special sounds and animations that would play after you enter it. This is a pretty big deal in the course of gaming history, which makes it an even bigger deal that it's in this game because it's the only Yu-Gi-Oh! Game Boy Advance game with the Konami code implemented in it. It doesn't do anything too crazy in this game, as you're only able to use it after you've won the National Championship trophy, and entering it simply lets you rewatch the credits again. But this code would actually come to haunt this game, because not too long after its release, a user by the name of Keyblader1985 discovered what we call the shop glitch. This is a crazy underflow glitch that lets you obtain an unexpectedly large amount of cards right as the game starts. This will cause the game to freak out quite a bit, which can lead to a ton of cool possible outcomes. However, the important part about this is that it overwrites parts of the game's memory and affects your written save file data. Very often, this will overwrite the part of the game's memory that is related to game progress and it will trick the game into thinking that you've beaten the game already, even with no wins and no trophies. So basically within seconds of starting a playthrough, you're able to perform the shop glitch, then instantly enter the Konami code and watch the credits roll of an at least 4 hour minimum playthrough game. And people really do love these sort of glitch playthroughs, which is why Seven Trials to Glory has become rather infamous and inspired many short speedruns and playthroughs of the like. Honestly, considering no other Yu-Gi-Oh game had a crazy glitch that messes with the game's memory like the shop glitch, the Konami code could not have gone in a better game than this one. So shout out to Konami for that. But we also did get some wonderful Easter eggs in the post game. And normally, this area looks like this, with not a whole lot going on. But after you obtain the very hard to get survival ship trophy, a Shadow World card shop appears every day except for Saturday. This is neat because every day a different villain is tasked with manning the shop and has their own special set of structure decks related to their character which you can buy from only them. However, this place is pretty expensive so 
you're probably not going to visit here very often. Which is why it's super cool that the devs decide to add some special greetings that the merchants will give when you visit. But the best ones are Arcana, who tries to brainwash you into buying stuff, and Seeker, who says he just wants to go home, or that he doesn't get why he has to watch the store, considering he's the strongest rare hunter out of everyone. And that is pretty true. And actually, if you look long enough, you're going to find one very specifically priced deck for sale from Merrick with a number that you should come to recognize by now. So this card shop is pretty awesome, but we of course can't bring up the post game world without mentioning that Konami brother Solid Freaking Snake from Metal Gear Solid makes a cameo here. He's of course sporting his classic cardboard box disguise, which is widely used throughout the Metal Gear Solid series, and in this game, it's appropriately a Kaiba Corporation cardboard box that you can actually talk to or duel if you wanted to. While he normally sits still in a corner somewhere, if you manage to visit him on the right day, you will get to see the rare sight of him walking around in his box, snooping around the premises. And like I said, you can duel him, but his deck is just the same deck list that the other endgame opponents use, but either way, this has got to be one of the hypest crossovers in Yu-Gi-Oh! history. Now we actually had a few of these Konami crossovers that happened throughout the other games in the series too. One of my favorite of them being in the Sacred Cards. As you're progressing through the story, you have to defeat some minions in the park before you're able to challenge Weevil for his locator card. You then unlock a business building on the map, which ends up being the place where you fight Loomis and Umbra on the roof after they kidnap Mokuba in the game. And if you visit this location, you'll notice that on the front of the building, we can see the words game written across the top. Then, once you walk in, you find out that the first floor is a dedicated video game arcade. And right smack dab in the front, we have two people using what appears to be a Dance Dance Revolution machine, but it's actually the Yu-Gi-Oh! Universe version of DDR called Super Dancer. This franchise is referenced a few times, with the biggest one being in the episode where Taya gets into the arcade battle with Johnny Steps. As you can see from the episode, the circular style dance pad is almost exactly on point with the arcade game in the Sacred Cards but it actually goes a little bit deeper than the surface. If you've been playing this game with sound, then most of the music fits this whimsical and adventurous tune. But the second that you entered the building, you're met with an absolute banger of a song that almost seems out of place. You might also notice that this song is only playing on the first floor of the building as well. And this is no coincidence, because this very soundtrack is actually from another Konami series called Beat Mania. This franchise was one of the greatest pioneers of the rhythm game experience back in the arcade dominant era, and early in their cabinet making days, they would come to feature a song which we know as Miracle Moon. This song was a pretty big fan favorite and made it into many subsequent Konami releases, even being included into the release of Poppin Music 2, which is another Konami rhythm game franchise. Each one of these releases got a remix version and had some varying difficulty levels. This song's popularity would continue to soar three years later and right around the time that the Sacred Cards was released, Miracle Moon would make it into a Dance Dance Revolution game for the first time ever in the arcade and console co-release of Dance Dance Revolution Extreme. This would ultimately take the song from early Beat Mania days in 1999 all the way to appearing as a Super Dancer song in the Sacred Cards in 2003. And I've gotta say, 
The GBA version holds up pretty hard, and it's got the whole first minute of the song with inflections for the vocals, so if you're ever in the area, do feel free to stop by and hang out. But Dance Dance Revolution wasn't the only one who got a reference in this game. There's also a mini shout out to the infamous Celadon Mansion building from Pokemon Red, which has a game development studio on one of the floors and is mostly known for the place where you go and get the Eevee. And for this, they decided to make the third floor of this building also a game development studio, but much smaller as what I assume to be a sincere gesture to the Pokemon games for providing them inspiration for this game. Other than this building, we only got a few small easter eggs, a cool one being a pure area, which you don't really spend a lot of time on in the game, besides beating Bandit Keith and Mind Control Joey, before getting teleported to Grandpa's card shop. But if you visit this area again later in the game, it actually has two sub-areas. The first is the top left area, which will have Mako appropriately peering over the docks, giving you a chance to duel him and farm more water cards after you've beat him in the story. This area also has a hidden area on the side of this building with the hostages that never get used in the game, but instead just get trapped here forever, even after you've defeated the ghouls. And I'd say the last little cool thing this game did was change the dialogue for every single NPC to mention something about the upcoming finals once you've reached the end of the game. Many of them will give you praise for making it so far, or they'll warn you that Kaiba and Yugi will be very hard to defeat. But an unlikely friend in these times is actually Rex Raptor, who instead has a dialogue tree that will ask you how you're feeling about the finals before giving you some words of encouragement. While we didn't get to see the arcade again in the sequel to the Sacred Cards, Reshefa Destruction, we do at least get a reference to this with an optional side mission where we can duel Johnny Steps under similar circumstances to the anime, which is a neat little throwback. But Reshefa Destruction actually had its own special set of easter eggs, a great one being this painting of Shady located in a side room within Pegasus's castle that you can access near the end of the game. Attempting to talk to the painting will trigger a cutscene, and Shady will give you some extra details on the plot of the story if you ask him to elaborate. Shady will basically fill you in on all the details from when Pegasus loses his eye after the Duelist Kingdom art and starts traveling back to Egypt to continue his research of dual monsters. This would ultimately lead Pegasus to discovering the power of her chef and Shady reveals to you that Pegasus was actually trying to lock Reshef away forever using the power of the three god cards. In actuality, Pegasus was taking all the steps needed in order to resurrect Reshef instead of locking him away. And as he progressively got closer, Reshef would begin to slowly take control of his mind and slowly regain power from the process. These were some juicy story details that didn't get included in the main story and honestly, you better read it up good because you only get to do this once before Shady disappears forever, even if you leave the room or even if you leave the area, so be sure to make it count. But this Easter egg is actually sort of bushly compared to the second one. Because somehow, in the course of developing this game, the decision was made to have a cameo of Gomon Impact from what we know as the Mystical Ninja series. This is another beloved Konami franchise with a long track record of games stemming from a wide variety of consoles. This series stars the ninja Gomon, who has a pretty similar historic representation to our version of Robin Hood, but of course it's way cooler because it's anime, and Gomon himself would undergo many stylistic changes over the years, but we typically know him as this guy. In the lore of these games, Gomon has access to a Gundam-like mecha that he will fight in tandem with to accomplish his mission and defeat the evil dudes. So this of course has nothing to do with the storyline in Reshef of Destruction, where this Reshef guy 
basically tries to destroy the world, so this guy is appropriately the final boss in this game, and this takes place in Grishev's tomb, which you have to beat him in order to save the world. But as it turns out, someone on the development team was a pretty big fan of Gomon and devised a brilliant easter egg that utilizes the password machine inside of Grandpa's card shop. It's normally used to unlock cards in the shop for sale, but it's also programmed to accept a secret code that will modify the endgame sequence and replace Reshef the Dark Being with the Gomon Impact Mecha. So this is actually pretty insane to look at and it honestly feels like a meme, but this is the real deal for sure and it doesn't change the deck list or duel in any way and this is the only one time you ever get to see it so this is definitely something that's neat that's built in here and you've got to try it if you ever do manage to make it to the end of the game when it comes to gx duel academy i'd say the only true easter eggs in this game appeared during an event involving gerard and will only occur after you've met everyone in the slifer red and raw yellow dorms You'll walk in on him as he's cleaning your room while you are away, and he'll then start asking you some questions in order to collect information about his undercover news article. There are some funny answers in here, but when it comes to the question of how much hair does Chancellor Shepard have, the correct answer is zero, but the last answer we can choose is the Konami number 573. The question after that will then break the fourth wall by asking you what the name of the game is, and you respond with GX Duel Academy. But besides this event, we only got a few small references that are present throughout the backgrounds of the game. A cool one being the attention to detail on Professor Banner's room, which is filled with books and of course has no bed, just like it should be in the lore of the story, whenever we discover that he is not a human. There's also this building, which you can barely see on the map, and appears only during the cursor travel to the volcano. This building would actually represent the school's hot spring, which is a location that you could visit in one of the later DS games, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Spirit Caller. But my favorite thing to look at in this game is the posters that appear in some of the rooms. And let's start with this one that is hung up in our personal room in the Slifer Red dorm. And you know, I couldn't figure this one out at first, but then I randomly came across this image on my Google searches, and it's almost a perfect match. And from this image, I was able to discover that this had come from a Yu-Gi-Oh! DVD box set cover that was only sold in Japan. And this was pretty cool at first, and then I realized Jaden doesn't even stay in this room himself, so we just have a picture of our boy chilling in the room, and that's not sus at all. There's also some cool posters in the card shop of this game, although they become hard to see once the dialogue has started and you can only see them for a second. And upon further analysis of these, I've been able to identify a few of them. For example, I know this poster here is either related to the OCG exclusive Duel Monsters 4 Yugi edition, but is most likely a reference to the cover of the Duel Monsters 3 guidebook with the hand straight up in the air and Merrick and Kaiba on either side. We also have this one on the counter, which is very easy to decipher, and it's a copy of Yu-Gi-Oh! Dungeon Dice Monsters for the Game Boy Advance. And over on the left, I'm not gonna lie, this one, no clue. But this one on the very far left, I've concluded, is most likely a scuffed copy of Yu-Gi-Oh! Worldwide Edition Stairway to the Destined Duel. I mostly suspect this, as you can kinda make out Kaiba's face and jacket on the right, and it looks like they went with a green jacket Joey instead of the normal blue jacket over on the left. And this is what I can only assume to be Yugi in the middle, somewhere. After taking the time to identify these, I started to notice that there were a few of these references in the other GBA games as well. For example, that same guidebook cover from before is also hanging in your room in Seven Trials to Glory, and it can even be seen in the main card shop in the Sacred Cards with that same exact color scheme. Also hanging in this card shop is what I believe to be a more color accurate version of Worldwide Edition compared to the one before, seeing that Joey has his blue jacket on this time. 
The last one I recognized in here is a pretty solid pixel rendition of the Dark Duel Stories cover hanging over by the password machine. We could also see Dungeon Dice Monsters sitting on the shelves of Grandpa's card shop, and in our room, I had originally thought this to be a copy of Falsebound Kingdom, but I've come to discover that this is most likely the Japanese version of Dungeon Dice Monsters oriented on its side. And this room is actually the same in Reshuffled Destruction with some small changes, so this is a pretty neat little testament to their very first GBA game. And some of these other ones in these rooms are pretty hard to identify. I've never been able to figure out what these two posters are, and they're even seen in the arcade of the Sacred Cards as well. And I've always thought this was Sly for the Sky Dragon, but I'm starting to think that this is maybe a horse or something. I don't know, I need a better hobby. But the last little tiny Easter egg I want to leave you all with is this couple on a date at the aquarium in the Sacred Cards. You eventually have to duel both of them before you're able to challenge Mako, but the true treat in this is that the couple sticks together long enough to make an appearance in the sequel to this game, Reshuffle Destruction. Truly a wholesome moment about love and sticking together. Which is what we need to do, so be sure to subscribe and stick around for other cool secrets I've got along the way. I'm gonna go try to talk to some random strangers who have their headphones on, so be sure to show me some love in the comments and stay tuned for that spicy Yu-Gi-Oh content. And a more red version of this art had appeared on the first disc 